Welcome to the Behind the Bits podcast. Your host, Scott Curtis, wants to learn everything he can about stand-up comedy and take you along for the ride. Scott and his guests talk serious about comedy in every episode. Behind the Bits will uncover knowledge from different perspectives on subjects such as writing and performing stand-up comedy, as well as booking shows and the comedy life. If you're thinking about becoming a stand-up comic, already in the comic game, or a comedy nerd, Behind the Bits is the show for you. Now, let's get Behind the Bits. So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando Resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll Up to Win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 U.S. and D.C. 18 plus entered by 4223. See rules at RollUpToWin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited. It's uh, William Conway. He, he won his first uh, comedy contest in 2002, which coincidentally is his first time performing. So I want to talk about that a little bit. In 2007, he was convicted of robbery and spent nearly 10 years in prison. Uh, that gives you some life experience, doesn't it? After getting out, he returned to stand-up and has been producing shows and winning more competitions ever since. It's William Conway. How you doing? Hey. Great. Thank you. I'm doing fabulous after that intro. That, that's probably one of the best intros I've ever had, Scott. Thanks. Yeah, Thank you I that. you know, I I do I do my my stalking as much as I can to uh be prepared for this. Uh and and that's that's what I got. So um I, I want to go right to that comedy competition, uh that being at least one of you, nearly one of your first times on stage. Can you tell me how that came to be? and how you want to, and just, just tell me all about it. I, I, I want to, I want to know the whole story. Yeah, sure. No, uh, it's, it's a very interesting story because it sure don't happen every day. <laughs> um, it, it, it was literally the first time I ever went on stage to do comedy. And at the time, uh, I just had a bunch of friends in my life, you know, cause I mean, I, I partied all the time. I was always, you know, I was, to be fair, at the time, I was pretty drugged out, and I was still partying quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But I always made people laugh at these parties. And so people were pushing me. They were like, dude, you have to go try, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was really the pressing of my friends that made me. And all I did is, and it was, so the Funny Bone in Sioux Falls, South Dakota was closing. And it was at the corner of Fifth and Phillips, and it was in the basement of the brewery there. And they were they were closing, and a new company was taking over, and it was called Nitwits. Okay. And so they ran this open mic competition because they needed, like, house MCs for the new Nitwits club. And so the, com the open mic competition, whoever won that, got put into the rotation, and the rotation ended up being about once every five weeks because mm -hmm. there was, like, five house MCs. And once every five weeks, you would do a Wednesday show, a Thursday show, two shows on Friday, two shows on Saturday. You got paid twenty five dollars a show. You got a couple drinks for free every night that you performed, mm -hmm. you know. And so I went to this competition and like I just went to the open mic and then I get there and they say this competition. I'm like, OK, whatever. I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, like I have zero expecta expectation of winning. And I went up on stage with like two or three stories that I told at parties that always just got people rolling. Mm -hmm. And um, the way that the contest, that particular contest was running is they had three judges that, that, pick, or, uh, that pick a top three. Mm -hmm. And then those top three at the end of the night were brought on stage and they did like a crowd applause of who the winner out of those three were, uh -huh. which in my opinion is the best way to to do that. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, like in my opinion, I, I think that you need to have judges and you need to have the audience vote because like 
otherwise it, it gets real murky. Yeah. You know what I mean? In my opinion. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, so, uh, and I remember, so the headliner for that week was Kathleen Dunbar and she was the, she was one of the judges. And, and I remember talking to her after the show and she like, she almost refused to believe that it was my first time on stage. She's like, and, and I forgot that this is, uh, I bit the bullet that night. I was the first performer oh. after, after like, yeah. So like, it was my first time on stage and I bit the bullet yeah. and, and I won. Uh, <laughs> but to be fair, it was like, I had no idea what I was doing. I mm -hmm. had no idea what I was in for. Like I was thrown to the wolves, bro. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like I had a vast learning curve coming quick. Yeah. So thinking about those stories, the you, stories that you tell your friends that you bring on stage, it's, it's almost like the experience of writing. It's, you know, it's almost like the experience of, you know, put, putting together a set and you yeah. went up with those. Can you, can, can you, and, and I don't want you to do the set, but can you tell, just give me kind of a, um, uh, like a Cliff's notes of what those stories were and, and what kind of reaction you got? Uh, I have no idea. Like, uh, <laughs> that is many, many drugs ago. You yeah. Know I mean? Like, I have no idea what I did that first time. I, I wish I did. I wish I knew I'd be doing it today. Probably. You know what I mean? I'm not yeah. even a lot. Why, why would I throw that away? Like, like, for real. Like, um, no, and I'll tell you what, like in the early days, I did not understand the importance of recording everything. Yeah. You know, which which I do now. Like, like now I record everything. I listen back to every set that I do because uh, especially for my style, because like I can sit down and write and i have sat down and and wrote out bits i i used to do it all the time uh and i'm pretty surgical with it mm -hmm. but to me that's just not as fun for me on stage mm -hmm. like like i can go up there and i can regurgitate the exact same thing the exact same way and i can make people laugh um but that's not fun for me right you know what i mean and so um so i just kind of have a different approach these days um that's kind of outside the box of the norm um, mm -hmm. but I mean, I do definitely understand the benefits of, of sitting down and writing out sets. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So you, you win this and that gets you the MC spot and you do your first MC, uh, gig. What, what was that like compared to doing the contest? Um, I mean, you know, it, it all came, I've always been a pretty, um, uh, what, God, what's the, it's such a simple word. I'm going to be so mad that I can't remember it, but it's not, <laughs> um, like eccentric. I've always been like an eccentric people person. All but, mm -hmm. Like even when I was in high school, like I remember my junior year in high school, like we had an open period where it was like a common period. You can just hang out in the lunch area and there'd be like three tables of teenagers just sitting around listening to me tell stories mm -hmm. because I was a new student from a different high school who had went to treatment already who had already been through a bunch of stuff. Like I'd already been in my first shootout at that point. You know what I mean? So I had some crazy stories to be telling in high school, especially when you consider it was like a podunk high school in Northwest Iowa. You know what I mean? Like they're not yeah. used to hearing stories like this. It was crazy. <laughs> so like, like I literally for years had already had, you know, groups of people and like my whole idea of what the audience is, like really allows me to just further that because like I have no fear of the audience because the way I look at the audience is as an, a new extension of my friend group. Mm. These are just more of my friends that want to hear. They're here because they want to hear the stories that they've heard my other friends tell them that I tell mm -hmm. like, dude, you got to hear them. You know what I mean? Because that's how, that's how it always was. And And when I look at them, when I, when I take that mental perception of what the audience is as this new extension of my friend group, it it, it, it disarms them a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And and it, and it makes me more comfortable, which they in turn feel, you know what I mm -hmm. mean? And dude, like, like a lot of people, in my opinion, they come away from my shows 
you know, go, whoa, like I never saw that coming. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Because I even talk about, I talk about crazy, crazy stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I joke about suicide and all of that stuff. And at, at least directly to me, there's not a lot of people that complain about my comedy directly to me. Mm -hmm. I know I got haters. Everybody's got haters. <laughs> but like, um, I mean, it's, I get the process. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was, right. I was really, st I wrote this down. If you notice me writing stuff down, it's when I interview people, I, I get these little nuggets that I, I, I want to keep with me and I, I keep a notebook of that and uh, the ones I was writing you notes on before, but you said the audience is a new extension of my friend group. So I've never heard it put that way before. So I hear comedians say it's me against the audience and I've heard comedians say it's it's my job to be the court just just jester to make them laugh and stuff like that. But actually, I guess trusting the audience enough to tell them, you know, your deepest, darkest secrets and make it funny is really extending them as part of your friend group. And, and that's, that's a really unique way of looking at it. And we all have to find our way of connecting with the audience when we get up there and myself, right. I'm a much more guarded person. I, I, they only get like a third of who I really am when I'm up there because the, I don't want them to know the rest. And, right. and yeah, no, I undress pretty fully. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? For real. Right. And I, the, I, fa I, the fact, the fact that you do that, you know, I think is probably, you know, what, um, makes you know makes the audience be on your side pretty quick into the set i would imagine right well and i think too is that um so i, I have learned that like uh talking about my robbery early on in the set um to a crowd that doesn't know me can be off-putting you mm -hmm. know what i mean like and and i've learned things like that I've learned that um, they have to know that I'm not that guy because like, so I joke a lot about the tragedy of my life because uh, Mark Twain said that uh, uh, tragedy plus time equals comedy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And George Carlin said that you can make anything funny by taking one aspect of it and stretching it beyond belief. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, my childhood was tragically beyond belief. <laughs> <laughs> So I can pretty much just go up there and tell real stories and people laugh. Mm -hmm. you know? And and really the way the way I started being more real in my stories was because um so I joke about only having one testicle. Mm -hmm. And th when I first started coming back to comedy, I I told about four or five different stories on how I lost it and none of them were true. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um but one of the stories I told uh, was uh, involved my sister and my sister got mad at me. Mm -hmm. She like texted me and she was like, what is this joke? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like exactly that. It's a freaking joke. Like it's not supposed to be something that's believe, you know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. And, uh, but I was like, I was like, okay, well, if everybody wants me to get honest, I'll get honest. And then I started talking about some of the real stuff and then and then my whole family stopped talking to me basically uh, <laughs> like be but um it was kind of a mutual decision because i was like um um uh, i'll be honest like i came up in a family full of secrets and as i learned more and more um it's a pretty prevalent thing i think every family has secrets every family has skeletons in their closet mm. uh but my family was especially uh, secretive and swept everything under the rug and didn't talk about things. And, and like the abuses were like astronomical, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so like, I've pretty much come to a place in my life where anybody who doesn't want to admit that these things happened or whatever, I have no time for you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like, because that's some, that's um, it. When you, when you in invalidate, things that actually took place and you you know like it it's so offensive to me that i just to me it's intolerable anymore mm -hmm. so it's not a huge loss on on my part 
you know, in my opinion, uh, although Matt Napa would disagree, he tells me that I should reconnect with my family all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'm just connected with some of mine too. So, yeah, I just, mean, you know, it's, it's the way it is for now. Yeah. Yeah. So, thinking about the, you know, the, the robbery, I mean, you do a great bit on it, uh, from the, from, from the tape you sent me at snow jam, the, thank you, you know, ro you know, robbing a flower shop and, and all that went with it. Um, I mean, it makes for great material, but it really fucked up your life. I mean, it, super bad. I mean, okay. Um, Yes and no is what I'm gonna say to that uh -huh. because I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that is a little bit controversial I'm sure but I mean prison was the best thing that could have happened to me. Uh -huh. So um, expand on I, that. Tell I, me I, why. Sure, uh, I needed prison um, because so I mean my childhood w was incredibly messed up. Um, and and pretty much everything I learned about how to deal with people was wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, like 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 what I was taught and what I saw around me. Like my world perceptions were just super whack. Mm -hmm. And and like for years of my life, for like uh, for my teenage years and into my early twenties, like I did whatever I wanted to do in a moment. And if you had something to say about it, we could fight right now. I don't care. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I was, I was a dirt bag kind of person. I was a drain on society for sure. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like, like I, I pretty much had no redeeming qualities. Like by the time I went to prison and like, and started taking a, a, a look back, I like, I honestly had to ask myself how I had a single friend. Mm -hmm. because my character was that low mm -hmm. um but i didn't but in like and i'll and i'll say this till i die in my defense at that point i didn't really know any better you mm -hmm. know what i mean because who the hell was there to teach me yeah. because the people that were there to teach me were you know uh being you know they uh, you know i'm not gonna get in the details of it but it was nasty nasty stuff mm -hmm. you know and so um I remember when I got sentenced by Joseph, Joseph Nealis, um, he said to me uh, that what he saw in me concerned him greatly. Uh, and what he saw in me was he saw the evolution of crime is mm -hmm. the way he put it. And, the, and what he meant by that is he said, you go long periods of time with, without being arrested. But every time you're arrested, you're arrested for something worse than the time before, which leads me to believe not that you go long periods of time without committing crimes, but that you're out there committing crimes all of the time and we're just not catching. You. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a sentence to help you understand that this is not how you want to live your life. Mm -hmm. And those words hit me like a dagger to the chest. Bro. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then I got sent to prison and I went through the processing. And at the end of that processing, um, based on like factors like my growing up, my substance abuse, my criminal history, they determined that my projected recidivism rate, which means that uh, within, I think, five years, within five years of going back to prison, this is the likelihood uh, within five years of being released from prison, this is the likelihood that I'll go back to prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and my re my projected recidivism rate was ninety five percent. Wow. And um, and I was <laughs> I was so mad when that lady told me that. And I remember <laughs> I remember sitting up in my chair and pointing to the paper on her desk, and I said, I don't care what that piece of paper says. I'm never coming back here. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Now you can say that all you want, but, but now that meant I had to change. Mm -hmm. And that was a long, hard road out of hell, bro. Yeah. Cause you know, so I've never been to prison. Um, but it sounds like 
your time in there, it was, it was nearly 10 years. It was like nine and a half, right? Yeah. Um, nine years, nine months. So you came, you came out of it with a clearer picture of the person you're supposed to be than when you went in. What was it about being inside that taught you that? If, if you're not getting it from your parents, you're not getting it from uh, anybody in your family, what, you know, what did being inside do for you that you're able to get on a podcast now instead of, uh, instead of going out and committing crimes? Right, right, for sure. Um, so for one, I took advantage of every program that I could, mm -hmm. like if there was a class, I was taking it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this is something that I want to take a second to say, um, at least, at least in the system I was in, I can only speak for the South Dakota department of corrections and, and the experience that I had there. Um, people will tell you that rehabilitation is not available. And, and that's not true. Um, they don't hand it to you on a silver platter. Mm -hmm. If you want to be rehabilitated in the South Dakota Department of Corrections, you got to go get it. You got to go after it. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, I was, I was at the school trying to get in classes that I shouldn't have been able to get into. Uh, I got involved with the Alternatives to the Violence Project, which was a totally voluntary program that was brought in by outsiders that wasn't even like associated with the prison. I got involved in uh, church stuff, you know, and faith based stuff, which, uh, you know, I highly recommend no matter what your faith is, you know what I mean? Like, like I think it's very important for people to have something to believe in and, and call on, you know what I mean? Um, because without faith and hope, um, there's not a whole lot of, chance for change mm -hmm. you know what i mean because you just get stuck because for a long time i had this idea in my head that this is just the way i am mm -hmm. and i can't help that but you know and really i think it was the things i learned in avp uh about my co like how to change my core beliefs and stuff like that and understanding you know the misconceptions you know i had to learn you know why you know it became like i had to understand it mm -hmm. you know what i mean i had to understand why i was the way i was mm -hmm. you know and once i came to that place of understanding it freed me to not feel guilty anymore to not feel hateful anymore you know what i mean that mm -hmm. place of understanding just allows me to be and move on mm -hmm. you know and um but i was uh, i was very active in 12 step groups inside. I was, um, I started the aftercare program, uh, on the Hill in Sioux Falls. Like, um, I mean, I, I was doing everything I could because, um, I knew that's what it took. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, um, because like, while while there were a lot of bad things in my childhood, like, like I still remember, uh, like coaches and stuff from middle school and high school who, you know, if you want something in this life, you got to put in the work, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like there's nothing in this life that really gets handed to anybody, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so, um, and you got to learn, so you got to learn what that work is, how to do it correctly. And, you know, and, and, you know, the whole thing about success is there's a lot of different ways to measure success mm -hmm. you know what i mean like some people will say that i'm not a, a successful comedian and i think that there's certainly a lot of argument for that it's not like i've ever put out a special although i certainly have the the ability to or whatever mm -hmm. but i've just never like I've, i haven't had the opportunity to do it in the way that i want to do it which is what's super important to me mm -hmm. to me it's not important to get a special out there so that everybody can see me like when i when i finally do a special i want to do it in in the way that i want to do it and i don't want people telling me how it's going to go or whatever mm. so i don't care about that but i'll tell you this uh i grew up in a town of less than four thousand people in northwestern iowa and i can tell you for a fact that there are people in multiple states that have t-shirts with my face on it <laughs> <laughs> which is something 
that's something that nobody in my hometown ever thought I would do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it it matters on how you measure success. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm a success just because I'm out and actually pursuing what I love and what I dream. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, um, it could be a lot different for me in a lot of different ways, Mm -hmm. but it's not. You know what I mean? Like the numbers said all this different stuff about me, but that's not the way it is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so to me, I feel pretty successful for the most part. Yeah. And like in my low times and thank God for my wife, because like, dude, my wife is like my rock. She lifts me up when, when I'm really hurting, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, And she helps me in ways that she doesn't even realize because uh, this journey of being an artist, any kind of artist, you know what I mean? It's tough. And it's especially tough when you're in the levels that aren't making a whole lot of money, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And so uh, I'm very grateful to the people in my life, uh, especially my wife and especially like some of the comedy, like Matt Napo has been amazing to me Mm -hmm. uh, when I was really early on in my career. Uh, Dante the comic was a mentor of mine and uh, was really there for Mm -hmm. me. Uh, Nathan Holtz in Sioux Falls, when I first started coming back to comedy, was an amazing dude and really uh, helped plug me in. Like he helped me get plugged in right away because when I first started doing shows again after prison, then like, and I waited like two years after I got out. Um, but when I first started doing shows again, after I got out of prison, my first couple mics, uh, Nathan Holtz was putting me on showcases uh, immediately because, mm-hmm. you know, they could tell I was seasoned already. That mm-hmm. I, but I also did like three or four shows during the last like 18 months of my prison stay because word finally got out that I had done comedy. And so that kind of became, a yeah. so I did prison. I did comedy in prison, which was a weird experience. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because you you mentioned the uh, one one of the things that really kind of sparked the desire to get back into it when you got out was that roast you did of one, yeah. one of the uh, one of the guards. Was it a guard or a trustee or no? It was so it was the uh, it was Jim Halsey. He was the cultural activity cultural activities coordinator okay in springfield for like 30 years or so Mm -hmm. and their job is basically like they do a lot they handle a lot of the religious activities and they also do like that person that position is probably the most involved person with helping keep inmates connected with their families Mm -hmm. like that cultural activities coordinator position is a very, very important position. And Jim Halsey had done it for decades and everybody loved that dude. Mm -hmm. Like everybody, inmates and staff alike, like you couldn't find somebody to say a bad word about this guy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they were doing a retirement party and they, for the first time ever, they were going to do a party in the visit room and inmates and staff could all go to it. And the guy that was organizing the party decided that he wanted to roast Halsey because that's how inmates show love. Mm-hmm. And and uh and everybody that he talked to just kept saying my name. And so this dude literally comes to me on a Friday evening. Now I haven't done anything to do with comedy in like over eight years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's been a minute since I jogged my comedy brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy says, well, I want to do this Rosa Halsey. And I was like, well, how long are you thinking? He's like, 20 minutes. I'm like, well, when is it? He's like, Wednesday afternoon. I was like, <laughs> yeah, you don't want much, bro. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sure, sure. Let's, <laughs> let's do that. And um, so I realized, um, for one, I got my ego out of the way and I realized what I was asked to do. Mm-hmm. And um, I understood that, listen, like we can, we can do a lot of softballs and layups and, you know, because the idea is we want everyone to just have a really good time. Mm -hmm. So like as a comedian, um, I don't like the, the performance wasn't very artistic. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was hilarious and it slayed and Jim loved it. And like he still he still has the tape. Uh, like I've heard from people <laughs> that he he kept the they recorded it and he I would I wish I could get a copy of that. Now yeah. I should try and connect with him on that. But um yeah, he listens to it and you know it's uh it was a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. But it was really weird to do it for the officers Christmas. That was uncomfortable. Yeah. Like <laughs> I had I had a buddy do a show up in um, Valparaiso, Indiana, and uh, I think I think he showed up pretty uh, pretty stoned. I mean, it, it was just pot, but he was he was pretty high, and he didn't know it, but it turned out it was like a police fundraiser. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it it all went fine. It, it, it was it was no big deal, and but it was uh. It, it, it was just funny. He he just said that he was taken aback a little bit when he did that show. And uh yeah, it's 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 funny. Um so I don't I, I don't want to belabor the whole prison thing, but you know, one of one of the things that that I look at in people, it, it's it's the generational So how does it feel when you play roll up to win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 U.S. and D.C. 18 plus entered by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited. Passing down of bad behavior so and 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 like you said a couple times you didn't know any better because you lived in an environment that didn't teach you any better so coming out of prison did you have a little bit more empathy for your family in understanding where they were coming from or or i mean you know do, um, do you still have a chip on your shoulder so, you know, uh, both, uh, just so we're clear, both of my parents have now passed on. Mm. Uh, my dad died on my birthday in 2020 and, uh, wow. my mom passed away, um, in 2021. Mm. Um, she died of COVID. Um, I did reconcile with my father while I was in prison mm-hmm. and, um, and the way that that came to be is because like, uh, you know, um, my dad was super abusive for a long time, um, but it is definitely fair to say that his abuses were certainly attached to his drinking, mm-hmm. um, and 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 not fully like like um, because like he stopped hitting us when I was like thirteen, and he was probably like eighteen months sober, but that was also because I I hit him. That was when I hit him back, but that's um, but like. When he stopped drinking, at least a lot of the super bad behaviors ended. Mm-hmm. And even when I was like 18 or 19, he he would call me up like once a week and, and or once every couple of weeks and invite me out to lunch. And I would go to lunch because it was a free lunch. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and I would like berate him the whole time. And he tolerated that. Um, and like he never left or anything like that. He just took it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when I got to prison, uh, I actually, I remember when I was in jail, I wrote my dad a letter and I was like, and it was a nasty, nasty letter, bro. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it was full of like, I bet, I bet this just makes you so happy. This is what you always wanted from me. You know, it was, it was toxic. It mm-hmm. was super, super toxic. And then I think I was in prison probably about three years and like when i would call home to talk to my mother um if dad answered the phone i would ask my mom and if he tried talking to me i would be like yeah i just want to talk to mom like Mm -hmm. i wouldn't even give him an ear Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and i and i pulled that for like the first three years i was in prison and then one day my mom said to me when she came to the phone after i had done the same old same old she said you know if you only knew how much he prayed for you Mm. and it broke my heart yeah you know what i mean it like it cut me 
to the core to think about my dad praying for me to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'll, and uh, that was our road back. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I, I mean, it's good that, that you were able to, you know, if nothing else, the time inside gives you a lot of time to reflect and try to understand things better. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad yeah. that you came out of it like that. So I want to get in, I, I want, I'm going to move away from that. I, I want to get into the fact that you are a guy, so, and, and you've alluded to this, you are a guy that could, could be a scary looking dude. And yet when you get on stage, even, right, even, right. even though you've, you, you've got big energy and stuff up there, I don't feel like, you know, and I'm watching tape, you know, I'm not watching, I'm, I'm not there live, but it doesn't seem like you really scare people. And, and, uh, I, I, I don't know. So, so on, on the same token, I am also a guy that could be seen as a scary looking dude. I'm a giant and, and I, you know, I don't, I don't smile a lot, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and, right. um, I do frighten people sometimes. And yet when I saw you up there, it just seemed like you were instantly able to disarm them and get them on your side. Do, is that something conscious that you know how you're doing it? Or is it, it is it just something magical that happens when you go up there? So, I mean, uh, I mean, my, for one, thank you. My stage presence is probably the thing I get complimented on the most, mm. uh, because, because yeah, for, and, and you're probably going to be surprised to know, especially early on, not as bad nowadays, but gosh, in those, in, in those early days, like the first two or three years, like I would be an absolute ball of nerves on the inside mm -hmm. like I, inside i am just I'm yeah. freaking out i'm questioning every joke i've thought about telling you know and um i'll say this so that to me uh atmosphere means a lot in comedy mm -hmm. and one of the things i'll say about nitwits comedy club was the the club atmosphere was phenomenal in that building even though it was a small cramped brick basement mm -hmm. room mm -hmm. like like what they did with that atmosphere was great and one of the greatest benefits i had is that when i would go on stage the lights were absolutely blinding you couldn't see anybody right away and then after a few minutes you can see like the first two rows well mm -hmm. you know what i mean and by then you've already got a couple jokes and laughs under your belt. And so seeing them wasn't such a big deal. Yeah. But like, you know, again, I go back to my, my perspective on the audience just allows me to go like when those lights hits me, it it's time. Mm -hmm. It's just that now, now we do what we do. Mm -hmm. Like now it's, it's time to tell the stories. You know what I mean? This right. is why I'm here. This is why they wanted to see me. Yeah. You know, like, um, I mean, to me, I guess it's all mental preparation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So like, you're definitely a unique storyteller. You know, I, I would compare you to like, like a Ron White or something like that in, in, in that right. vein. Um, and, and, and that's a hard, that's a hard thing to get into and succeed at it because yeah. you, <laughs> if, if you don't, if your story is not compelling enough to keep them along for the ride to the punch or any tags that you come up with, you lose them. And um, I, I just did an open mic where another comic came up and said, you had me, you lost me, you had me, you lost me. And, and, and I was glad she said that because I, I needed to know cause it was the first time I'd told it, but um in thinking about that, it's when you get into a comedy community and you, you've got these people you see a lot, you know, when you're small markets, big markets, you see, you see the comics a lot. What was the best and worst advice you got when you started and, and even through the years? Um, 
Well, Chris Porter, um, I I opened for him one week when he was coming through Nitwits, um, and he found out through conversation that I had one testicle, uh-huh. which at that time I did no jokes about whatsoever uh-huh. because I was I was um, I just didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But when he heard me say that, he like he stopped and he was like, "Wait." you have one testicle? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, and you don't use that in your act? And I said, no, why would I do that? And he was like, dude, that's gold. Yeah. And he was fucking right. Yeah. Because like, I, I'm not kidding you, bro. Like it is a rare, rare occasion when a one nut joke doesn't land. Yeah. And I don't know why that is. Yeah. I don't know. Like, and it, it almost doesn't even matter what I say about having one testicle. It's going to get a lab. I'm, and I don't get it. I mm-hmm. don't understand it. But it's definitely true. I've, I've done it. I've seen it a number of different times. You know what I mean? But, uh, and they eat it up. And I love it. It's fun. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's funny to, because I'll tell you what. <laughs> one of my most favorite things early on that happened to me. I was in, I was living in Sioux Falls. This has got to be like 2003 or so, right mm-hmm. before I moved to LA. And then um, uh, we're in a high V grocery store, and there's this guy in the aisle that sees me and he shouts. He's like, Hey, aren't you that one night comedy, comedy guy? <laughs> and I was with my son's mother, and if she could have crawled into the shelves, she would have because, <laughs> like, she was so embarrassed, and I was so proud. Yeah. It was just a beautiful moment. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, oh, man. How about the worst advice you ever got? Um, Man. Um, and Chris Porter is excellent, by the way. I just saw him here a few oh, months I love ago. Him. Yeah. He's so good. Yeah. He's so good. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, yeah, he's really funny. Um, Let me – I, you know – I don't know if there is bad advice. I'm going to be honest with you because, okay. because um, it's all about what you take away from it or whatever. You know, um, it's really easy, especially with comedians. It's really easy to get um, advice from somebody and it cuts you a little bit. Mm-hmm. And my suggestion is learning how to not let that happen because like um, in Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls, from my experience, had one of the most nurturing comedy scenes that you could have Mm -hmm. like the they meet together for writing sessions with each other Mm -hmm. you know they bounce jokes off of each other like um they're very uh interactive in their bookings with each other you know like Mm -hmm. like they do what they can to lift the whole scene Like, like there doesn't see at least when i was there there didn't seem to be anybody that was like trying to push themselves above all others Mm -hmm. and when you have that kind of scene it's a really really good thing and it opens you up for constructive criticism Mm -hmm. and it makes it easier to accept Mm -hmm. so i mean you know i've had advice i didn't like or whatever like i used to um i used to do well and i still do sometimes um, a bit about going to a buffet with my family like you know like like the whole herd or whatever Uh And when I when I first started doing that bit, uh, I would say that we went to the Chinese buffet, and and during the joke, I would have like I would impersonate the manager with a Chinese accent, uh-huh. and um and people said to me that it was offensive to do that, um which I don't I'm gonna be honest with you I don't necessarily understand that. For the simple fact of I haven't been to a lot of Chinese restaurants that didn't have a Chinese manager. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, if you can if you can explain the logic and getting mad to me about it being racist rather than just true. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like I was doing the accent to be racist. We went to fucking China Buffet. That was a real restaurant. Uh-huh. That's kind of like what the guy actually fucking sounded like. Like, you know. Yeah. But. Because I didn't want to ruffle feathers, I switched it to Golden Corral, which we didn't have in most of the area that I performed in. Yeah. You know, so to me, you know, um, like um, I, I changed the joke and I wish 
that, you know, um, that was like probably the first time that I ever succumbed to somebody telling me how I should talk. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I didn't necessarily like how it made me feel in the end. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it's funny. I had one that, um, I, I portrayed myself as my, my wife's gay roommate and I thought that that could be offensive. So I just changed up to I'm gay. That was the punchline. And that turned out to be the offensive thing. And, and, you know, you know, fortunately somebody told me, you know, um, and, and I was able to go back to the original way I did it, but you know, I was second guessing my own punchline and I, I didn't need to, but yeah, I, 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 I've gotten some, I've gotten some great advice and I've gotten some that, that wasn't so good. Um, so we are at a point, this is my favorite part of the show now that, oh, yeah. that I, um, I, that I feel so stupid that I didn't come up with three years ago when I started it, but it's called, is this anything? And this is where we both bring a joke or a premise or something that we feel like it might be funny, but we're not a hundred percent and we just give each other notes. Um, if you don't have one ready, that's cool. Um, I do. Um, but since you're the guest, you get to, uh, choose if I go first or you go first. Oh, I mean, uh, let, let's have the, let's have you go first. So I have a good solid example. Okay. Okay. I, um, so this one I actually wrote yesterday when I went on a hike. Uh, so, uh, Oh, this is one. Okay. One of my favorite things to do when I'm hiking is carve my name in trees, but I do it a little bit different. You know how everyone puts the date on their little carvings? I do too, but I carve a future date and I include an ominous message. Like today I carved SJC 115 29 and fight the AI. That should make everybody on the trail a little unsettled. Yeah. And that's it. No, that's beautiful. That's great. <laughs> And that would that that's that's good stuff. Too, yeah, I, there's so many trail walkers around here, man. You've given me a golden idea. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because because like I'm super mischievous like that. I'm like uh, I'm very much like Jim Morrison. I like to push the boundaries of society like as much as I possibly can. Uh -huh. And like freaking people out like that. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. I, it, it was funny. Cause we went past one of those trees where everything was carved. And I was like, what if somebody carved a future date? How, yeah. how would people react to that? And then I, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm vacillating between uh, the AI or um, uh, fight the machines or the machines of risen or something like that. Something, something that, you know, is uh, relatable today. Uh, but yeah, I, I, yeah, no, the fight, the AI, I think is really good because it's such a hot topic, right? Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to, yeah. I'm, I'm going to try that at a mic and see how it lands. But I thought, it, you know, I, yesterday was one of those days I didn't want to think about anything. And of course we're out hiking and a joke jumps in my head and I couldn't, couldn't let it go. I took out my phone and put future date. That's the only thing I wrote on my phone was future date. And then I wrote the joke and I did it for a writer's group last night and I thought they were okay with it too. So I'll give it a shot. Right. Yeah. No, it, <laughs> I, I think, I think, uh, I think the crowd will enjoy it. Yeah. So, so what you got for um, me? So actually, so this, this is actually, I want to give you one. I tried this joke on stage one time. Okay. Okay. And and it's not so much a joke as it is a story, mm -hmm. as are most of my things. But oh, uh, I want to preface this with the crowd reaction that I got from the one time was like not just crickets, but almost shock and awe. Like a okay. lot of gape jawed people looking at me, like what in the hell? Yeah, and then you, you could feel the air suck was, out of the room. <laughs> Yeah, and then I've done that too. At the same, at the same time that that was happening, there was one table of three guys that were practically on the floor laughing. Uh -huh. you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, uh, like it's one of those things where like, uh, okay, the masses may not like this, but I don't know. It's still, 
pretty freaking funny because these guys almost peed themselves. Uh -huh. You know yeah. what I mean? So um, I was a young man. I was like 18. And I was living with my girlfriend. And one day before work, she starts to give me a blowjob. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was kind of getting, I was getting kind of pressed for time or whatever. And so I'm like, hey, baby, you got to, you got to hurry this up. I got to go to work. And she just stopped. She's like, go ahead. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like you can, you can finish, but I need to get going. No, no, just go. And so she just, she just leaves me hanging. And like, like, uh, after it been, like, she'd been working on it quite a while too, by the way, that uh -huh. factors in, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I had to walk to work, which was like a four block walk to work. So like now I, uh, I get to work and like, and I'm like, I'm really in pain. I'm uh -huh. in a lot of like, it hurts. It literally hurts. <laughs> right. So I get to work now at where I work uh, for a telemarketing service a devil type of telemarketing service. Uh, I will say like they were a terrible, terrible company. They did. They ripped off people real, real bad. Uh -huh. Like um, it's terrible that I worked there to be honest. Like they, that company was the reason that, that they made so many telemarketing laws, like for real, <laughs> like the, they were up to all of that stuff. Uh -huh. Um, But anyway, um, so I, uh, because I am often mischievous and do things I shouldn't, uh, I had been ostracized from the entire calling floor, and they had me in my own row way off on one end of the calling floor. I was all by myself. Uh -huh. and, and so because I was ostracized the way I was and I was in pain the way I was, and I figured nobody's coming around here to see what I'm doing, I can't. I can't like just take a break and go to the bathroom mm -hmm. because they're going to get on me about not being on the phone. And so I just, I'm calling discover card members on behalf of American bankers life and American bankers insurance company, of <laughs> Florida. How are you doing today, <laughs> sir? You know, and, um, uh, it really, like, it really bothered people. Um, like, cause I emulated, I think I just went too far and uh -huh. emulated like because I emulated the whole coming and wiping it with Kleenexes on my desk. Mm -hmm. um, it horrified most of the people in the room. Uh, but some guys thought it was really, really funny. Yeah. So, so I don't, I, I don't think it's, I, I, I don't think it's that um, outside of the um, norm. I mean, I, I've heard things similar to that. So the only thing right. I would do is, when you're explaining the telemarketing company, if you don't have anything that is just like hilarious as a tag, I would just say I worked at a telemarketing company and because of my antics there, I was ostracized and they put me in a right. corner by myself. And then w when you're talking to somebody on the phone, you know, you know, you, you gotta, I would come back to the fact, okay, I'm still fully engorged and I got to do something about this. So I get this lady on the phone and the first thing I ask is what you, what are you wearing? And, right. and so, okay. and, and you sound nice, you well, know, just, be, I think it'd be better. I think it'd be better if it was a guy, especially today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you could, yeah. I would role play that conversation a little bit more instead yeah, of yeah, jumping right from being on the phone to um, coming to clean it up. I, 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 I would actually take that, conversation and make that something of a joke inside the joke, you know, cause you can right. get a, you can get a ton of tags off that. I mean, you're supposed you know, to be I selling probably... insurance or whatever. And, um, you know, you, you, you start talking about, uh, um, man, you smell good from here, you know, th th right. that type of stuff. Right. And so that you yeah. can actually, actually get enough of a picture in your mind to finally stop the blood flow to your cock, you know? Yeah, <laughs> dude, I think, uh, you know what, like, as, as you were, I really didn't think about this until just now when the, the joke, like a lot of times, you know, you try and think, okay, you know, I got to get to the funny, career, but like, you made me think of expanding this somewhat because like, I have a lot of other telemarketing stores. Mm -hmm. I would probably do 
I could probably do a whole hour just on working at that place. Yeah, yeah. And, like, everything that happened. Because it was, like, like when you said, like, things about the telemarketing company that were bad, like, um, I remember uh, one time I made a lady... I made a lady cry. Like I badgered her like on sales. Uh-huh. <laughs> I badgered her to the point where she started crying and she gave the phone to her husband. Uh-huh. And I sold the husband <laughs> while hearing his wife cry in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so it was one of those kind of places. Yeah. Like I remember the quality assurance lady was like, you can hear her crying. I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, but now I'm talking, like I'm talking, like because we were arguing about whether or not it was going to pass uh-huh. on tape verification, because, you know, because, but I'm like, listen, they don't know on the tape why his wife is crying. You know, because you were monitoring my calls. I rebutted her nine times. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, so they don't know that. They she could be crying about what she sees on television. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? So, so like, you know, um, yeah, it was just- that would be, and I, I can talk about joke writing like for hours, but the fact that you've got, you've got the blowjob joke and you're, you have to set the scene on where you work. You could, right. you could have a couple decent tags about the telemarketing thing and the joke. And then, man, I got to tell you more about this telemarketing job, you know, just, almost yeah. almost like a yeah. callback and then yeah. then go into that one so you you know they're yeah. a nice package <laughs> they go together um the transition's mm-hmm. perfect so yeah i i think you've yeah. you've got you've definitely got something there and um yeah just um make sure you're you've got enough tags along the way that keeps people leaning in right yeah the chuckles in there yeah but yeah you that's know, um one of the things that very first night when I won that contest, one of the things that Kathleen Dunbar told me because she knew, like, after talking to me, she knew I didn't know anything. And now I had this job about how to do comedy. And she told me to get this book. It was like stand up comedy, the book. I forget who wrote it. Um, but uh, that really taught me how to, that book really taught me how to take an audience on a ride. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um, I'm very much a believer in like, like I'm not a heavy hitter. Like, like my, my laps per minute, uh, does not tick the way that most people want it to. Mm -hmm. But, uh, at the end of my show, you're going to be glad you came. You're going to be surprised. You didn't hear about me before. If you hadn't heard about me, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, and so as long as those things remain true, I don't really, I don't really care about my laughs per minute, mm-hmm. but I do definitely like the value of having the chuckles along the way. If you don't have the chuckles along the way, then the payoff is never really as big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and I, I used to, and you're too young to remember these guys, but I used to watch um, a show called Two Ronnies, and it was a British TV show. And one of the things that the, one of the Ronnies, I think it was Ronnie Corbett, would tell a story at the end of the show. And the funny thing is, is his stories would start out one place, and then they would branch out in all these different things, but then he'd bring them all back together at the end. And he, yeah. the it wasn't a big last per minute thing. It was, and, and that's the way British comedy is, but you're on the edge of your seat because you know what his style is and you don't know how he's going to be able to bring it back around. It's like watching a TV show with 15 different plots. How are they going to, how are they going to tighten yeah. this up and uh, make yeah. a good ending out of it? It, it was, it was kind of like that. And uh, you know, that's, that's what I like about storytellers that can do that. And it's so, it's so intricate. It's hard it's it's really hard to do that and keep people with you during that time. But yeah, I right. I I think I think your jokes got legs. I think I I, I keep trying it and uh, right. d- and and try to try to get to the point where you know everybody or most people laugh instead of three. You know, um, right? A lot right. of my jokes yeah. do that too. But uh, yeah, this this has been a fun talk. Um, where can people find you if they want to? get you online uh so uh i'm on facebook william conway on facebook i do have a conway comedy facebook page 
But to be honest, my William Conway uh, page is actually uh, got m- way more traffic. Mm, um, yeah. Because they gave me digital creator status, which kind of switched things up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I really, uh, I really need to learn. Uh, I need to figure out technology because um, that's part of why I don't do as well because um, uh, technology is still very confusing to me. Yeah. You know? Like, I was like, I probably, I don't even want to know how much money I have on, like, from online videos and views and stuff uh-huh. um, that I can't, don't have access to. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> I, I, I feel you. Yeah, that's a uh, lot. Yeah. And then uh, William Conway uh, on my YouTube is just my name. Uh, I'm sitting at, like, 84 subscribers right now. So uh-huh. uh, if we could go over 100, that'd be you know, fantabulous. Yeah, that's like, great. I, I'd be, I'd be ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, uh, this year it's gonna, be, it, it will be harder this year to find me doing comedy stuff because I am focusing more on music right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm definitely still gonna do some shows. Um, um, and and then uh, I'm on Coffee with the Dog with Matt on a fairly regular basis. I'm pretty, sure I'm gonna be co-hosting that tomorrow with Carl Mann, we're going to be uh, stepping in for Matt. Mm. Um, so Coffee with the Dog, for sure. Check that out. His, uh, I'm on that quite a bit until uh, Matt gets tired of me. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Matt won't get tired of you. He's cool. No, yeah, he's he's awesome. He's, yeah. he's one of my favorite people. Yeah, excellent. Well, it's been great getting to know you, and I'm, I really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure on this. So how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 U.S. and D.C. 18 plus entered by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited.